G'day guys, welcome to Rumble's Fish Room. So, as you can probably tell by my singlet, I'm completely unorganized today. Um, but Rusty Wessel is having a chat here at the PCS venue. Um, I'm not going to sit here and chat about it. We're going to get stuck straight into it. So here we go. Can we uh, dim the lights? Yep. I appreciate the Perth Club having me come in and talk. Uh, Daryl from, from Melbourne sent me this gift with me falling off. <laughs> If you didn't know, I, I fell off a roof, I broke my leg, had a concussion, and I apologize to the club for not being here in November. I know with volunteers, it's always a, you know, it always throws a monkey wrench into your, your setup and so, when a speaker cancels. But, but I was in the hospital for 19 days, or so, so, uh, but I'm back and I appreciate you having me. Uh, tonight, the program is the Fishes of the Maya. Before, one of the things I did in Brisbane is I got to go out and get in one of the rivers. I wanted to see some rainbows, so this is one of their activities. So, this Sirius Creek, I was in filming and, and saw some beautiful rainbows. That's a crayfish. And then, all of a sudden, <laughs> this looks at me. So they have these eels there. Pretty cool. And it was like a meter long. It seemed way bigger to me when I first saw it. But anyways, that's just from whatever, four days ago, three days ago. But he was really curious. He loved to look at the camera. I guess he could see his reflection. Um, Two quick announcements. Uh, well, first, I want to thank Ash for picking my, me and my wife up from the airport. And uh, Mike, thanks for having me come in. I really appreciate it. Um, the American Sickle Association, which I'm a fellow of and a member of and on the board. Uh, the next ACA convention is in Sacramento, California. But the year after that, it's going to be in my home club, Louisville, Kentucky. And it's the 50th anniversary of conventions for the ACA. So it's a pretty big deal. Uh, one of my sponsors, Cobot, uh, they brought some food in for you. There's uh, four samples there. What's great about Cobot fish food, I don't, I don't even know if it's available yet in Australia. It might be in a few places, but it has uh, probiotics and prebiotics injected into the pellets and flakes. So you feed a third less and it doesn't discolor your water. It's really great food. My other sponsor is ZooMed. I don't know if y'all have ZooMed products, but they have light bulbs, filters, power heads, and foods. And lots of stuff for reptiles too. So check out ZooMed um, <laughs> I'm not sure if she was the source of the coronavirus, but I caught her still in toilet paper on the planes. <laughs> Another activity before we get started is I go out to Salt Lake City, and uh, this is the Great Salt Lake from the, and there's a guy there named Bob Allen. He gets a permit to collect brine shrimp. We all know how expensive brine shrimp is. You know, a can, a small can is like 100 bucks in, in the US. So their activity was to take you out. This is Bob Allen, and that's Mike Dennis. Bob's got a microscope. So we were out one, one morning or one day for about six or seven hours, and we had not even a cup full of eggs, just a small handful of eggs. And it was freezing cold, below freezing the whole day. And I told Bob, with his permit, he wasn't allowed to go into the commercial areas where the, where the, the factories were. And so we're driving, and I told Bob, I said, Bob, and, and let me tell you another thing, Bob is Mormon. He's a practicing devout Mormon. Like, and he, he, he gives great fish talks, but he rarely gives them because they're on Sunday. You know, he, he won't miss a Sunday church. So he's real straight laced. I asked Bob, I said, Bob, let me drive your car because I'm going to tell him I'm from Kentucky. And I said, I can't read or write. We should be able to get right close to the factory. There has to be more eggs near the factory. So we did that. Here's the eggs. We got up to the OSI factory. Then they were just closing up. They were still harvesting eggs. There's the boat that they pull in from harvesting these brine shrimp eggs. And these are bags 
of eggs that are big as a truck. So it gives you an idea how many eggs are in there. And here, near the factory, these are all eggs that have washed in. And they were 80% hatched, so these were, were good eggs. There's Mike picking up some eggs. Now Bob promised me that I would never show publicly him <laughs> getting eggs at the factory. So, but if you see Bob Allen uh, from Salt Lake City, tell him that, uh, the, well don't tell him I showed these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so the program tonight is on Mexico, pretty much Southern Mexico, Guatemala, and just a little bit into Honduras. It's the area where the Maya lived thousands of years ago, the local Indians from Mexico. Guatemala and Honduras. But it's a cool area, like 8% of the world's biodiversity is just in Southeast Mexico alone. And that, that's, it's, so it's really intriguing, it's a great area. You've got all these different types of biotopes. You know, you got big, you got uh, rivers that are deep water, water, you got shallow water, you have planted areas, cenotes, springs, waterfalls. We use a cast net when we collect, a circle net that en encircles the fish, drops down on them, and then you pull it in. Some things you see in Mexico, uh, cows. The food is chicken, beef, and of course, cichlids, fish. What species is that one? That's Herichthys uh, turquoise. Pineapple, and you'll see this brown dog in this is my daughter. This is my daughter from years ago. Um, they're putting mascara on her, so this was a, our, one of our exchange students' sister. But it's a pretty safe place to go to, uh, the whole area of the Maya. You know, there are some problems. I mean, the cartels do exist in these areas. The Zapatistas, the, uh, the bad guys of the area, they're still there. But it's reasonably safe, like I said, I've taken my daughter. Deforestation, huge problem all over Central America. I mean, the trees are coming down, just so many people everywhere you go. There's Juan Miguel, Artigas is off. Juan Miguel, he's, did he speak here for you guys yes, just recently? Yes. Juan knows well. more about Mexican well. fish than anyone. And he has a great site on, on the web called Cichlid Room Companion. It's the best site for cichlids anywhere, barring any place. When we collect, we have a big seine. It's a 12 by two approximately with very small mesh because we want to catch the small fish because that's what we bring back. We don't bring back the big fish. So the first place we'll go is up here. It's called Cenote Escondido. You'll see that brown dog. The reason we went here is because Juan Schmitter Soto, a gifted ichthyologist, described a new species about five, five years ago, four or five years ago, called Rocio gemata. And, uh, and it, it really intrigued me because we all know, y'all have Jack Dempsey's here, and, uh, but he described this new one that comes from this area. So we all jumped into the, rented a van, went to the Cancun area, and headed off for the, we had a GPS coordinate. That's my friend Vero Serrati, one of the owners of Cobalt. Gene Longino in the back, that's Howard Schmidt and Rudy Z from Detroit. And uh, we got within one kilometer of the habitat and then there was a tree falling across the road. So we had to walk the rest of the way in. And we got there and found the cenote where this Rocio Gemata was described. And it's a, uh, the habitat, those are cork trees that are growing out of the water. We found the water wasn't stagnant, but it was very, very low oxygen. This was the owner of the cenote. He, he told us he was a retired engineer. I don't know, maybe he was. But this was his house, no electric. He said he would eat two Jack Dempsey's every night that he would catch out of the cenote. But this is the Rocio Gervonta. Is it different than the Jack Dempsey that we have in the hobby? I don't know. It's squattier, yes, but I tend to think that's from the low oxygen in the water. Um, but who knows? 
The blue spots are supposedly more in line. But here, Sonoti Escondido is Howard Schmidt. You know, I've been on hundreds of collecting trips over the years, and Howard is the funniest guy that I've ever collected with. He's, he sells fruit and vegetables in, in downtown Chicago. And he was a little bit scared of the water. Actually, he was real scared of the water. And he had this mask from the 50s. It was like, a, I called it a Jacques Cousteau special. You had to get a nut and boat, or get a, a pair of boat, tight, or a pair of wrench, the nut tighten down on the, the nut and boat in order to keep the mask from leaking. And it's still weak. Here he is white knuckling it. It's hard to tell, but the mask is half full of water. But the best <laughs> part about it is he wanted the snorkel, but he didn't have a snorkel. We didn't tell him that. And here's where the nut is, right here. And he should have had a snorkel. This, it's hard to tell, but right there it's half full of water. But eventually we bought him a little play bass from Walmart and he put his head down the water. But before that happened, he was drinking beer and fell asleep in the sun, laying on his back and got a little sunburn. But anyways, in this Sonoti Escondido is the bluest Jack Dempsey that you can find in the hobby that naturally occurs. And this is the animal that they breed back to the electric blue Jack Dempsey, which is a hybrid. They breed this back this, they use females of this race to bring out the blue in that fish. And here they are underwater. All the photos, unless they're categorized or, or labeled as from aquarium or from, from underwater pictures from my trips. There's the Sonoti Escobedo. And here's one in aquarium. And y'all have Jack Dempsey's here too. Roberts and I. It's another fish y'all have. Correct? Yep. Uh, the one that y'all had, I believe, has more red in the tail here, and I think it's from Belize. Uh, this one happens to be from Mexico. Very blue. Another fish from that spring that's really conservation minded, it's very important. It's called Ogilvia piercy. It's a lot bear. It's a blind cave fish. It lives in the cave system near Cancun. And the problem with this fish is that the, all the divers come in from Cancun, you know, the American tourists or whoever, there's usually six, eight, ten of them in a big pack. They start off in the rivers, in the open water, and then they go down into the cave, caves and then go through the cave system. The Mexican tetras are following these divers through because the lights, they're eating up the food source of this fish. So this is an animal trying to get out of Mexico to get it established in the hobby before it's gone. But there it is. I've seen two in the cave system, probably diving seven or eight hours in the water, and I've seen two alive. But it's pretty cool. Uh, Mel Melanurus, Sinspilus, uh, I know you all have this fish again. A big cichlid, Frederick Stolle, and these, and some of the Mollies, Pacilia ori. That's the male, beautiful red dorsal, and the female. Big gobies, this is the sleeper goby. And then the Jack Dempsey that comes from Sonoki Eden, just one, one lagoon away, but it's a little different. And definitely the, the blue sp spots are not in line, they are in a different shape. Balferi, the big green selfie molly. Now we'll go to Laguna Bacala. Hey, and again, you'll see that brown dog. Laguna Bacala is a very clear spree, or it's clear lagoon, very shallow, and it's the first place that you find the Ricky's Beaky or the fire bell. The Beaky, and this is probably the Miki that's in the hobby, most of the places you view, because back in the turn of the century, the Americans, the rich Americans that went to Mexico, they would use Laguna Bacala as one of their spots that they could stop. And they would collect fish, bring them back in tin cans, and it was the Miki, one of the first fish that hit the American hobby and the German hobby. But unfortunately, the Miki that come from here don't have much color. They just don't have good red in here. 
But the further you get south, the more colorful the fish become. Chattel Melensis, fish y'all have in your for your raffle, very similar to that, is Spilurus. And we'll get to see Spilurus here shortly. And then there's Salvini. And uh, I know y'all have Salvini here. I think there's some in the, the raffle also, which is great. And uh and I think y'all get those donated, is that correct, Mike? All the yeah, fish. Um, so they've been donated by um local people like local fish stores. So Okay. Um, yeah, That's true. Special one That's true. Anyways, one thing you'll see here tonight is many shades of Salvini. Very different, all of them. But here from uh, Laguna Bacala, they're very yellow with nice black pattern. This shows you what the lagoon looks like. Crystal clear, and that's the reason we went there primarily, was to get photos of Therichthys under the water. But the fish, again, have not much color. Even the Sinspilum, you know, they just don't have good color. This fish now is called Melanurum. They changed the name, they combined them just recently from nomenclature. The Spilurus here. And go a little further south, we'll see the brown dog again. And this is one of the cave systems uh, near Cancun. And what basically happened is the top of this underground cavern caved in. You step one foot off the edge, it's 250 foot deep, just straight down. And what's interesting is this, the cichlids that live here had to, had to uh, basically live on the edge of the cliff. You know, cichlids are always near the bottom. You know, like this is a river system you know, the cichlids are going to be on a pile of rocks here, there. But in this situation, the only place they can live is on the edge, and usually in the, like less than oh, 30 meters of water. But you've got Patinia splendida here. And this shows you in a lagoon near there, Miramar, a big pair of Patinia splendida with their babies. What makes a cichlid a cichlid? It's the fact that they have parental care. And they'll take care, you know, they, they guard the eggs for five or six days until they hatch. Then they'll guard the fry for anywhere from 30 to 45 days, depending on the species. And, uh, but the patinia get very, very large. They're actually quite tasty. It's a, considered a food fish down there. They're excellent parents. And I know you all have patinia in, in Australia. I've seen them in several people's tanks. And they'll take care of their fry until they're pretty good size, too. And once they uh, reach, once they get so big, then they'll disperse into their habitat, and then they'll probably go breed again. But that's the patinia. The melanurs from here, since phylum, did you all know them? Notice the white spots. So they're variable. And then the Miki, because we're in deep water, the Miki have more color. And here's uh, Melanurus, or Sense Violin. She has some wigglers back in here. And again, this is on the edge of the cliff, probably 20 meters deep at this point. And there was a pair that we'll see here in just a second with Fry. Again, living on the edge of the cliff. And to me, that's just interesting that they adapted and figured out that they can, can breed and maintain their Fry living on the edge of the cliff. But with me down there scuba diving, it kind of scared them off of the rocks. And they move out into the open water which they had to, to watch predators from all directions. And that's what they're doing here. I mean, from all angles. You see a Mickey swim by. This is the male, that's the female in the background.
very beautiful, but the light was very, very dim at that depth, but they're still very beautiful. Uh, nearby, Laguna Colba, a place where you find more Therichthys miki. We call it the black miki because of the black coloration when they spawn. Very different than what we have in the hobby, even in the US. But this is the male, the females here. Super parents, very easy to keep. To keep these in aquarium, they need to get warm during the summer months, but they also need a cool, cool area. They need to get to be very cold through the winter months. If you don't do that, you'll be susceptible to bloat and or uh, they'll just end up kind of shrinking or get these fins that look messed up, almost deformed. So they like it warm, but they also like it cold. Now we're going to jump over to the western side, go to Dos Canos. You'll see that brown dog again over there. Rocky habitat, riverine system. First place you find Therichthys macula pinnis. Y'all know this fish is Eleotai. The pair and the female with babies. There's also a Shinops molly here. They're very beautiful. It is the most aggressive of all the Therichthys. And when I say aggressive, they're really not aggressive. They rarely beat each other up. And all the Therichthys types really don't beat each other up there for you. They'll die for many other reasons, but not from fighting. You can see the barring. If you see barring on, on a Therichthys, you'll know it either has fry or eggs. For babies, there goes the male. The babies are here. But that's Therichthys macuapens. There's also Nebuliferum. This is a very rare cichlid, even in America, in the States. And uh, very popular. I don't really know why everybody wants it, because this is as colorful as they get. They're basically just a gray silver fish. But that's Nebuliferum. Babies are all right here. They live in the fast flowing current. To keep them in aquarium, you need good pristine water conditions. Don't overfeed. Venestratum. Y'all may have Venestratum. Y'all Catamaco Venestratum, I think. I think I've seen them here. But, anyways, uh, they get barred when they breed. But watch her. That's her job right now. She's the Tetris are trying to eat her young. So this is what she does all day long, protecting those babies from the Tetris. They're ganging up on her. Babies are just right here. There's the male. That's Venestrata. And then some beautiful Salvina from Das Congress. I think y'all have salmonite as a donation, right? So notice the red in the belly region. So every river location, the salmonite look a little different, sometimes significantly different. But here's the babies and the females. There's the male. Notice just a little bit of red on him. Actually, each scale has a little bit of red on the outer cover. And there's the female. Now we'll go to Rio Candelaria. This is a very remote area of Mexico. Not many people. You'll see that brown dog again. Uh, Candelaria, this is the upper headwaters. The water is very clear. You have a, a big, giant uh, pike-type pike library of Bologna socks. See them here in the water? 
they live right amongst the cichlids. You know, they do get pretty good size, especially the females. And they'll eat tetras or they'll eat, they'll eat cichlids. They're a predator. And out there? They are a lot there, yes. And their babies look like little pencil fish, if you're familiar with them. And here's them. But that's below the size. And the Miki from here, I get further south they go, a little more color they get. This is the Candelaria Miki. They even have red up here. And there's the Miki. There's also another Therichthys living in the same river system. You have uh, Therichthys heleride, female the pair. Their eggs are here. They dig one pit where they deposit the eggs. You have heterospilla here. And this fish is really cool because this fish lives with big piercy and big bifasciata, cichlids that get well, well over a foot. And they had to adapt. They don't get very large, but they had to figure out a food source. So what they do is they flip leaves to look for food in the water column. And you'll see this one here, this little female, moving the leaves to search for a bite of food. There goes a bifos. Picks that leaf up, finds a new spot to look for food. It's a pretty cool bait. And the reason they do that is because they live with this fish right alongside it, the big piercing. I mean, you know, they get monstrous. They eat pretty much uh, fruits that fall off the trees. <coughs> Date, dates are their favorite food. That's the piercing. I think y'all have Pierce yet, too. I've seen it. And again, what I love about cichlids is their parental care. I mean, here's a pair of Pierce eye at Laguna Miramar. You know, they start off with Pierce eye will have maybe 700, 800 fry when they first spawn. And they'll raise them for, for up to 30 days or so, but they don't raise that many fish. You know, they get even as big as they are, the predators, the Mexican tetras, the catfish. You know, they get picked off one by one, you know, as they grow older. But both male and female are very, very good parents. You can see the fry here, just hatched out. They're just a day or two old, just out free swimming. This point. See all the babies here. And then a few weeks later, they're a little bit older, a little bit bigger. This is the male, this is the female. And then after 30 days or so, there's only six or eight babies left. And they're just about ready to turn them loose. You know, they disperse into the habitat, hopefully grow up to be parents like them, and then they'll usually breed again. And then the most, one of the most beautiful Salvini that come from this area it is called the Candelaria Salvini, and they are truly spectacular. Both male and female get red, and they stay red. Once they go into breeding dress, they stay this coloration for, for months and months and months. But just beautiful, beautiful fish. This is the male, this is the female.
look at the red. It's so different than what we find in the hobby. Do you have these in your shelves? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they've been distributed pretty well throughout the U.S. And I've heard they've made their way over here, but I can't guarantee that. Hopefully, you guys will have them sometime. Maybe they're in the auction. But unbelievable red coloration, even in the male. And that's what makes them different. You know, the male, in most of the Salvador species, the male doesn't get much red or no red at all. The Candelaria, both male and female get red. Just spectacular. And in the aquarium, they look just like they do in the wild. It's complete red. Now we'll go to the Grahava. There's a brown dog tied to a bumper. The Grahava is a big drainage, very muddy water, so no underwater photos. But the Miki are very red here. Fire mouth. Pet Menzis, the big Molly. This is an aquarium. The yellow, what we call the yellow fire mouth or Passionis. And then the red bifos. And we'll get to see some other color bifos later in the program. And then the salmon eye from here are different too. Females, beautiful, nice red. And in the aquarium, this is the female, and there's the male. Absolutely no red at all. So again, another another variant of the salmonite. That's an aquarium, the male and the female. Salmonite are very, very aggressive. They're probably the most aggressive cichlid in from Central America. Notice the black stripe here, this, these are two females fighting, but the black stripe turns blue just before they spawn, about a week before they lay eggs. The black stripe turns blue. The male's kind of back here, there he is there. He's just watching. And that was taken with my phone a year or so ago. See how beat up they are? There's the male. But to Salmonite, they get that black stripe will turn blue. That's how you know you've got it. Plecos have been introduced in, throughout most of uh, Mexico. They're in the Quetzalcoatlus system, where they, we found a recently, and the most recently described cichlid coming out of Mexico is this guy, which is Therichthys panchovillo. We call it the gold mixtico. Juan Miguel and I came up with this idea of the mixtico because we thought Mixteco was the local Indians that where this gold Mixteco was found. And, uh, but we found out the Mixtecos were like 200 kilometers away. So it's kind of a misnomer, but it's called Pancho Villa now. But here's the male and the female. They're easy to sex. The female has the black and white pattern here. And here they are in aquarium. And how I keep all my Therichthys in aquarium, I keep 30, 40 adults in one tank, one big tank. You'll have several pairs breeding at the same time. That's the gold mixed in. You say big tank, what's the What size? Uh, 125 gallons or up to 265 gallons. I don't know. Really yeah, I was watching a picture the other day. I was wondering how many foot long they were. How many what? How many feet sort of long were your tanks? Oh, so I found about six feet. feet. Six yeah. there, they are six foot, mm -hmm. so six, by six, six foot. Yeah, six yeah. foot by two foot by yeah. two foot. That's the foot. From this area, you have some beautiful sword tails, the green sword tail. This one we call Tapa, from the real Tapa. What's cool about them, some get these orange dorsals, some get dorsals with just spots. They, some get black spots. So it's kind of, it's a little diverse. It's pretty cool. We'll go to the Chacamax. Again, that brown dog. Now what I'm showing you, why I keep showing you the brown dog is because, you know, the fish, they can't cross a mountain ridge or they can't, you know, they, the, the dogs can, can drive, walk over a mountain. They can swim across a river. 
So all the dogs mix breed down there, and they all kind of look alike, and they really do. They're all brown dogs. But, you know, the fish can't do that. They species it. You know, they're from river system to river system, over time, they change. And it's important for us as hobbyists that you get some of these fish, that you keep them all river specific. You, know, you don't mix a salvini from one river system with another because they are different. Uh, we're in southern Mexico now, Chiapas, up in the mountains, deforestation going on. And another message on conservation. Uh, here at Dutatun, this is the real Chacamax. Fast flowing river. The Chacamax flows towards the use of Macente. Just this, this river, or the mountain system here, the use of Macente flows through here. And the Chacamax, they introduced Placostomus into it about 10 years ago. And these Placostomus, this fish here, South American, has no, no predators whatsoever in the watershed. So what's happened here at New Tatoon, there's the Chacamax that flows to that big river system, use of the center. It's the lar second largest river system in Mexico. It drains half of Mexico. And unfortunately, this pleco has been introduced into this region. All this black you see in the water are plecos. We'll jump in. This is about 10 years ago, nine years ago. And swim across and see what's happened to this. Used to be eight cichlids used to breed here. You could find them almost any day. Today, there's almost no cichlids breeding because the plecos have invaded, they've taken over the bottom. We were back there last year and the plecos are still there, not as many. But this is a good message on conservation. I mean, all of these fish we keep in captivity, it's a good thing we keep them because they're all threatened in the wild. I mean, fish can't breed in this habitat anymore. Any, any cichlid that lays eggs at night these plecos are this big. They'll come up and just eat the eggs at night. The cichlids can't defend them. And you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, what an invasive species can do to, to a habitat. The good news is there's, there's so many, they're becoming lethargic, there's not enough food, so there'll be a die-off at some point, and there won't be as many, but they're always going to be there. It's almost nearly impossible to get rid of them. It's just a quick article about them. They know they're a problem. Why they were there, we don't really know. We think maybe they put them in there because the algae, the rocks were full of algae. They wanted the algae gone. Well, that worked. But one of the fish that lived there at New Tatoon, Bifos, they might be able to breed with the, with the big plecos because they get big. It's a big male an old male in the aquarium, about 14 years old. But the Hellrai, the Thrichtes that live there, nearly impossible for them to breed. This is back in the lagoon before there were plecos, and there's some fry. In the aquarium, they'll get trailers. And how I keep them, there's lots of, you know, planted tank with, with rocks and this is uh, plastic plants. You can keep live too, they do okay. Uh, the bari, so they have fried or eggs. We'll go to Mizo Hall. You'll see brown dogs there too. This is Ross Sokoloff and Dr. Harry Speck, by some of my old collecting partners. Uh, they're both passed away now. Ross was the first guy to use plastic bags to bring fish out of from Brazil and the Congo. And he was the first to use styrofoam coolers, like the one sitting on the table. And he invented the styrofoam cooler. So he was the first to use tranquilizers, putting them in the water to, to, so he could put more fish, bringing them from, from Brazil back in the 40s and 50s. But anyways, here at Miso Hall, he found a fish that, that was eventually described with his name, Thericti Sokolov. It's the smallest of the three. 
It's a cold water animal. You need to keep it very cool or it will get deformed. Basilia mexicana there, very beautiful one. Very blue with the orange on the caudal. But it's a Basilia mexicana, it's a species. We'll go to the Bascon, more dogs. And this is a fast flowing habitat. And now you'll get to see the Salvinai that we probably have in the US. You all probably have the same one here. This is what the male looks like, and this is what the female looks like. Sokolov, back in the 60s and 70s, collected here many times and brought the fish into Florida, bred them on, in the farm settings, and in every pet shop USA had this variety. And they're actually still today all over Florida, you know, because some of them we've got released. And uh, this is probably the, the species that we maintain in pet shops. Sakalafi from the Bascon, barring, so they just got babies here. You see a female here with her bar, she's got her eggs hidden underneath the leaf there. But that's Sakalafi. And in the aquarium, look just like they do in the wild. One of the most beautiful, uh, Michael, should we do a timeout? Yeah. Keep going. Okay. It's a, we're a little more than halfway through, but uh, this might be a good breaking point. <coughs> I can keep going if you want, but if people may want to wake up. Okay. We're again in southern Mexico, so we'll restart here. Uh, this is Cerealis, means blue cichlid. This fish comes from fast flowing rivers. Oh, thank you. Did these get more? They live in the rapids. They have very small spawns, like 50 is an average size spawn. They're very, very pricey in the US uh, because one, they're rare, and two, they just don't have big spawns. And you need good, pristine water conditions. If you're not religious with your water changes, you'll lose this fish. Because its habitat is fast flowing stream, very clear as water. When the babies hatch, they take them out into the shallows where the babies feed during the day. They're cave spawners, they, uh, they'll lay the eggs in a, in a hole up underneath the rock. On the, they're very secretive. What's really cool about them is in an aquarium, you'll get ones that look like this. See the black spot? It's the male, all black spots. And as they color up, the black spots will turn white. And they become blue. Get black, and then eventually they turn all blue with black blotches. So that's Cerulius, the male and the female. Here they are in aquarium with their like 35 babies over, over here. Again, small spawns. They don't get very big. They're very beautiful. That's Cerulius. There's one place where it's got, instead of a black or a white spot, it's got a gold spot. So they're just a little different. The Chacojito, dog, up in the mountains of Chiapas. The best time to collect in Mexico is April, uh, this time of year, up to May. The water level's at its lowest. It's the height of the dry season. You can see how shallow here after the rapids. Then the pools form, the deeper water. This is where you'll find the fish. And you've got Chuco Intermedium, a big aggressive cichlid, but it has the hockey stripe there. 
and here it is in the weld. Pretty nondescript cichlid, it's basically gray and black. But in the same habitat, you have the only species or the only genus left in Therops is irregulari. It's kind of like a goby cichlid. They kind of, they almost hop around. They don't swim real well. But they live in the rapids. They have a little bitty mouth. Very colorful, very beautiful. Notice this one. It was in a cast net at one point. Still, the females tending her fry. Because they eat them there. You know, they get about this big. Here's the male, this is the female. And this is another species that you need good, clean water conditions or you'll lose them. That's the male. The babies are here. That's irregularity. And in the aquarium, they look just like they do in the tank. Big tetras in these rivers. Um, that's Guadalupenses. And then the other blue cichlid, which is in the next watershed, which you'll find, uh, went to Genosa. They're very much, very similar to the Cerulius, but the parents get twice the size of Cerulius. They have large spines. You know, can have 200 in their spines. And they turn blue with black bars when they breathe. Babies here. The male and the female. And they're really different. They're very, very cool. They're very unique. Here's the, the pair. And it's another very pricey cichlid in the, in the States. But they had to adapt too. So what they've learned to do is they flip rocks in search of food. They use their nose to flip, to pull the rock up and flip it over to look for a little bite to eat. You can see Biphos and Argentia, or Corti in this area. The bifos. She's looking and looking, and so that's the winter genosa. And when they spawn, they turn very blue with the black bars. Very, very beautiful. Kind of look like the blue black zebra in the, from like Malawi. And in the aquarium, what's kind of interesting, they do this almost the same thing as Cerulius. You'll have all these different color patterns going on. That's breeding dress of a male. This is normal coloration. Some of them have this pattern, completely different. It's this one. But once they start in the breeding dress, the black spot turns white. And when they go into breeding, again, blue and black. Now, you know, they, they move rocks in nature to look for food. So it makes them a bad aquarium fish because they take all your decorations and they push them right up front, including the rocks, every night. If you move the plants, you put them all back, they move them straight back up because they like the, to be secret. They, they're very secretive fish. Females back here with some babies. Here comes the male. He's wild. See his dorsal is a little bit messed up. But that's Lenta Genosa from the Chacolito. Now we'll go to the Rio Carolina. Again, southern Mexico. It's a big river system. You'll find bull right here. Another cichlid that I'm sure y'all don't have because actually it's very rare in the U.S. too. But they're very beautiful. Again, fast-flowing river, lots of bull ride. 
to see them everywhere. And this is in the shell. These are young ones. And as they become mature, they get like this. They'll lay, they're, they, they're an egg scatterer, basically. And they'll scatter eggs in about a, a one, one meter circle. And she's protecting. Those eggs are almost invisible. But all the other fish know she's got eggs and they'll sneak in and eat one as often as they can. Even the other boar, right? She's chasing them off. The eggs are just all through here. But that's the boar. And this one's eating eggs. There's an Argentia eating eggs. And here comes the mother. So that's bull right. Uh, Josh and I were talking at intermission about Zonata or Quetzalcoatlus. This is a wild Quetzalcoatlus in the in nature. When they breed, they get very golden color with a golden eye. And eventually, in aquarium, they get very blue with lots of red back here. And here they are in aquarium one of the wild males, but look how blue. Very different than what you saw when they breed in the wild. But even these, when they breed, will get that golden color. Is it Zonatum or is it Quetzalcoatlus? Um, we still really don't know. But, but that's the uh, Quetzalcoatlus, one of the wild males. And probably all the Quetzalcoatlus that are in the hobby came from this male. In the same river, you got the, the Therichthys, Caulepis. It's the biggest Therichthys that comes of all the Therichthys. It's the only Therichthys without the sub purple spot right here. And it's the only cichlid that lives in the rapids, where the water's moving the fastest. And this is the same river system where the Quetzalcoatlus live. They all came from the Rio Carolina. There's the Bulleri, they live with them in the rapids. And there's the Caulepis. This is a female. She's got a few wigglers, a few little babies moving down here. They have pretty good sized spawns. You can expect 150 or so babies. See the young here just hatched out. As they mature, as the babies grow, they get barring, just like all Therichthys. Here's the female. And they can swim backwards just as fast as they can go forward. And there she goes. See the young here? Here comes the male swimming backwards. Probably because of the rapids, they adapted and figured a way to, to guard their fry without turning around. So that's the cow lemon. It's an in aquarium, just like they do in the wild. The other fish from this area is called Pancovia, described recently. The blue mixed eagle, the female. They lay their eggs on a leaf or a rock. Here it is in aquarium. Just a little video. This one, I believe, is a female that doesn't like this male. They don't get along, but his, this male, his, his mate's back here, this female. She's got her eggs down here in the rock. She's already got little babies, but they just don't get along. But they don't ever 
They don't ever fight. They, I mean, they, they act like they're going to fight, but they don't. They don't beat each other up in aquarium. See, her babies are there, eggs. But that's the blue mixed deep. They're also here in the soul sutral. The dog's there, too. There's the real soul sutral. I was in taking photographs, and I thought an orange truck actually fell into the stream, like tumped over into the river because I was downstream and the water turned orange. I was like, what is going on? So eventually I walk up and they walked the cow down and slaughtered it right here. And that's the intestines. You never know in Mexico. But here's the soul sigil. And this is a typical habitat for therichthys that live close, always close to habitat because they don't get real big. There's some eggs here. And it's the blue mixed eagle, or Pancho Villa. Male and the female. The eggs are here. One nest. Clemencia, little sword tail, lives there. It's on the red list. You can't take them out of Mexico ever again. They're protected. And they live close to the shore, too. Here they are. And there's many of them in the river. That's a female. And there's the male. There's also intermedia here, Priapella. It's kind of like the rainbows from Australia. They're very, very colorful. Schooling fish, they need good clean water too. Cold conditions are best for them. That's the pre -appeal. And then the salvina from the Sol Sucha, all yellow. Completely different than, than the other ones that we've seen. Female tendon or fry. No red whatsoever. New Spinapa, there's a little goby. You have the third color variant of that Pancho Villa. And I tend to think it's different because it gets much bigger, as you can see, you know, bigger than your hand. The others don't get half that size. And it's the green mixed eagle. It has the yellow ventrals. And this is its habitat. It likes the slack water. It doesn't like the uh, fast-flowing stream. In the aquarium, this is what they look like. The male and female. The El Stuta River in Oaxaca. I show this because this is the habitat for Trimox. Ike Honings, years ago, did his cichlid yearbooks, and he had one picture. It's the only published picture of Trimox. And so Juan Miguel and I, for years, have been wanting to find trimax. And we've looked for them and looked for them. And they're very rare in their habitat. But we finally found them in the Ostuta. And this is a female herding her babies. These trimax are very beautiful. Do you all have trimax here? Are they around? Right. But gorgeous, gorgeous symbol. Very aggressive. We'll go to Nandabir, where you get to see the uh, Gramotis here. Again, a predator, big mouth. They primarily eat snails in the wild. They use that that basket face to go down into the sand to pick through the sediment to, to eat a snail. You can almost watch them. I think they can hear. I think they'll listen and they can hear the snails moving beneath the, the, the tritus. And they go down for their bite of food. It's 
So that's the Grimodes. And when they breed, they change colors completely. They get very black ventral fins. And they become very, very aggressive in aquarium. They pretty much, will, they're like Salvinon. They're going to kill everything else in that tank if they can. And they have canine teeth that they can rip the scales off of other fish. But that's the Grimotis. Now we'll go to Guatemala. Now we're here. Lots of dogs in Guatemala. Lots of bars in Guatemala. I don't know what happened here. This bar went out of business. He had to take his sign down. But literally, whatever, seven, eight bars in a row. Maybe more of the coronavirus, I don't know. Lots of people in Guatemala. Everywhere you go, the kids are lining the, the riverbanks. The roads are not so great. And another interesting thing about conservation, there really is no conservation in Guatemala. But they do, the trees are protected, and the only trees that are left pretty much are the ones along the rivers. And the reason they protect them is for the howler monkey. You know, they do, do protect the howler monkey, so that's a good thing. That actually kind of in turn helps the fishes because the trees are disappearing. Lots of bugs. Here I'm with Darren Hulsey and Ben Keck from the University of Tennessee, Dr. Eric Hanneman and Joe Middleton from the North, Northeast, Northwest, excuse me. And of course, that says uh, no fishing, so we figured that'd be a great place to fish. <laughs> and uh, this guy works at the University of Guatemala, and he uh, he actually he works with bats, but he's helped us get permits out of. Uh, and Doug here gets his uh, scuba tanks. But it's interesting, one of the trips we took, this bridge got blown up on a Saturday by the, the, the rebels, they call them. It was probably teenagers messing around. So we took us, it only took us a, a few minutes to cross the bridge on a Tuesday, but coming back on a weekend, it was all this traffic. But we'll go to Lake Patan, dogs there. And you see one of the areas where the Maya were, this is uh, Tikal, probably one of the greatest Mayan areas. Lake Batan Itza, a big lake. The town of Flores. Lots of valves and area in the lake. Lots of tetras. And this lake's very deep maybe 150 meters deep. Once you get past the Valzen area, you get out into the open water, this is where you find the big Melanura. You'll see them out here. And Finis is here, Therictes. And it's interesting because I always said this fish is just like the fire mouth. I don't think there's really any difference in it. One day it might be that Therictes Miki become a Finis. Because a Finis was described before Miki. So like the number one fish in the, the world that's sold from this area as far as Central American cichlids are fire mouths more so than even Jack Dempsey's. And they may be, one day, that name may be no more used. And they may all end up being a Phoenix. Time will tell, but they're very similar. But, they're, but they're, their throat is yellow. It's a different color variant. But they do something interesting in the, in the lake itself. Instead of one pit, they'll build several pits. And the female will move her babies from one hole to the next just before dark. We think the reason is because there's big catfish, predator catfish. They'll come in at night and 
try to eat the young, and that gives them an opportunity to wake up. The catfish will smell them here and here and here, but they can't find them. But here's the Finnis in aquarium. The other fish from the lake is Melanurus, the big cichlid. They're very beautiful. When they breed, they just become gorgeous. This is an aquarium, babies here. With all cichlids, the female does the lion's share of the work. She's, she's the true mom that takes care of them primarily. The male's always hanging around, but he'll be the first to abandon if there's anything he threatens. But here's the big male. And again, that's an aquarium. The Salvini here in Lake Isabel. Again, another different variant of Salvini. From every watershed, the Salvini change. Here they have a little bit of red. So it gives you an idea. Lake Isabel, lots of brown dogs. It's a big, big lake. This is the area where Bacorti were caught. See these thousand area plants? I was with Ross Sokoloff and Harry Speck. We were sitting up here having a beer. And Harry wanted to get back in the water after collecting all day because he saw some live bears here that he wanted to collect, Carl Hudzia. And he eventually talked me into get, getting, putting my clothes back on after showering, getting in the water. We seen this area and we caught the first live Bacorti that anyone ever seen. But this is the fish that many collectors for many years was after. And I think y'all have a court out here, don't you? That's great. Well, they all came from this pair that bred in Louisville, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. But that's a pair of Bacorti that were collected there at the lake. Here's the babies. They live with black belts and they live with the Carl Hubs the Asturida. If you're in the nomenclature, it's kind of cool. Carl Hubs was a collector at the turn of the century. And of course, Carl was his first name, Hub was his second name, and his son's name was Stuart. So he's got, his whole family's named after a fish. And there's the female. There's also Spinosissima there. This is just like the rainbow cichlid. They hang their babies like little tree ornaments up in the plants. Some protection. I'll show you Laguna Perdida in Guatemala. Again, the further south you go, the redder these fish become. Very, very nice. There's the Miki. And this shows a good show, uh, photo of the southern purple spot. It's like at the edge of the gill raker. So when they flare their gills out, it's supposed to appear to be another pair of eyes. So it appears to be a much bigger fish. And they use that as the worn off predator. Here's an old video of some in an aquarium protecting their fry. But they take turns. First the male comes out, then the female. Then the male comes out. And that's their job. But they're very beautiful. Passionas from that same laguna. Some have black gill rakers, some have red. We're not sure why. That's the Passiones. And this is in Aquarium. The, uh, this is another river, La Cienaga. The first place you find Therichthys aurium. You can always tell aurium by the blue streaking in the fins, such as here. The Salvini there, again, very different. Males, all yellow. Female, yellow, with a little bit of red in her belly, right here. Just a slight amount of red. We'll go to Agua Caliente. Now we talk about conservation. We've all heard millions of times about deforestation 
how you know we're cutting down the rainforest and, and, and the habitats are disappearing. And that is true, that's happening. But this example shows you clearly that that there sometimes it's just it's not habitat destruction because this is rainforest, but the Cienaga River here has very few fish left in it. The reason for it is because of overfishing. Locals use a cast net day and night and walk these rivers and they take every fish out of the river. Swordtails, tetras, little tiny catfish. Everything is fair game. And it's for food. But the habitat's perfect. The rainforest is all intact. The top 200 meters of this river, where the water comes out, is protected. It's in a park, and there's a guy there with a big gun that keeps the cast netters away. Here he comes, so I went under the water. And the fish are everywhere. But downstream, no fish. The fish know not to go downstream because they hear the cast nets hitting the water and they just won't do it. They all stay in the top 200 meters. And there's many fish there, arias, the blue arias. Again, barring, so you know they have fry. Here's the eggs. There's the eggs, plaque. There's Godmanai here. That's a big fish. Very different than intermedium. They get very red when they color up. Here's the big Godmanai. Again, all these fish only in the top 200 meters of the river. But it tells you that, you know, in some cases, we just have too many people in this world. I mean, it's overfishing that causes the problem. Here's the salvina from Agua Caliente, the male and the female. Spilurus, somebody got spilurus. Who got the spilurus? Nope. Okay, great. There's your spilurus. And the pair. There's also uh, Mexicana, Amali. and then the blue arias. See her protecting her babies. Very, very good parents. Now we'll go to Gracias de Yelps. This is a habitat in between basically the Atlantic and the Pacific fishes. And uh, here at this one river system, we found this potentially new and undescribed Therichthys, the Gracias de Yelps. The dorsal is unbelievable. Look at the black and white pattern up here. Unfortunately, this fish has not been bred yet, but we're working on it. And hopefully soon we'll get it either described or distributed, or both. There's my lures in the back. But is it Therichthys heleri or is it Therichthyarius? Juan Miguel tends to think it's heleri. I tend to think it's arius. It's uh, much more aggressive than heleri in aquarium, but it looks, it appears to be more like heleri, you know, just by visual. Um, oh. This is the real Subin. Notice the plants. Again, just a different habitat. Let's see, is this Look at the salvinite from here. Both male and female have red, but not a lot of red. But what we found with salvinite in the wild, and even in aquarium, they'll do this if you have a bunch of them in a big tank. The male digs a pit, makes a pit. There's a female. And the females come to the male. The male decides after choosing, and he might run off five or six females before he decides which one he'll breed with. With most cichlids, a male will, will pick any female. Any female willing to come to him, he'll pick her. But with the salvinite, they don't do that. Let's show it again. Just 
Because you see, here's his, here's his hose, his pit. He's working on it now, digging the pit. And you'll see a female come in, he, and if he doesn't like her, he just runs her off. He just ran one off there, but you'll see one better here in just a second. And that's a beer can. Ran another one off. Here comes a female. He didn't like her, so he runs her away. But once they do pair up and spawn, here's their babies. I just wrote an article in Amazonas Magazine about the Suvin Salvinine. It's not as pretty as the Candelaria that we saw earlier, the real, real red one, but they're pretty nice. I mean, this is the male. You see the red. Go to the Rio San Juan. We have more Miki, more fire mouse. Very beautiful. The Hellri from the same river. You got two two Therichthys living together. I don't recommend this for aquarium because they would they could likely hybridize. She's building her nest. See her go down. Again, in, in Guatemala, it's, you know, there's so much, so much trash everywhere you go. Here's some trash floating. Here comes the male. And at this stage, they're just starting to, they're, they're, they've already made their pair bond. They haven't laid eggs yet. They're still constructing the nest. They're just protecting the area. They're starting to build the nest, digging the pit. So that's Therichthys hell right. Now we're almost to the end. We're only gonna to go to one habitat in Honduras. This is the end of the Maya area. We're just barely into Western Honduras right here, where we have the Copan ruins, the real Copan, sleeping dogs in Honduras. Honduras is my favorite country in, in, in Central America, but it's the most dangerous. Dole Pineapple Corporation, or Standard for Fruit Company, have cut down all the trees in the lowlands and put bananas or pineapples, as you see here. And it was interesting, in the, in the 70s, Ross Sokoloff collected here. He could go only, only go as far as this bridge. There was no bridge in the 70s. It was a dirt road. It was before Dole came in and they had a uh, civil war there until the mid 80s and after the mid 80s we started going there and we found that they had dough had put in these wonderful paved roads all throughout the country so we were able to drive our cars to habitats that have never that you haven't seen before and that's where Theraps Wesseli, the fish named after me was found near that bridge at there at Hurtiapa. But here's a horse that got run over. And they, they have no infrastructure to remove things, so the only thing to take it away are the vultures. Their swimming pools are green or brown. And they're working on it. They'll eventually drain it, refill it, and about two weeks later, it looks like this again. They have a, they got Texaco gas stations there, Texaco. A guy, will climb up here, he works 12 hours, and he's got an AK-47. When he gets done, he climbs down, another guy walks, walks up and does his 12-hour shift. They tell me this gas station has never been robbed. <laughs> There's Ross Sokoloff holding a big king snake. And they played, the Mayans there played a game of football, or you'll probably call it soccer. We y'all probably call it football. We call it soccer, Americans. But the, the the idea of the game was to hit the toucan with the ball on the head, and the winner of the soccer game was sacrificed. 
and they would cut, cut his heart out and the blood would run down through here. The kings and queens would take conch shells and collect the blood and, and, and drink it. It was a ritual. A game I wouldn't want to play. I wouldn't want to win anyways. But the only place here where the, uh, the Mayas live is the Rio Copan. The ruins are right up here. But here at the Rio Copan, lots of snakes. I don't like snakes. And this was described in 96 as Pacilia Salvatoris, the Liberty Molly, because of the red dorsal and black pattern here. It's the home of uh, Microphthalmus, one of the blue cichlids. Notice the barring, that means they're breeding. And an aquarium, very blue, laying eggs, orange eggs. In the aquarium, you can see the orange eggs. But that's microphthalmus. The Spilurus change in this country, they start getting much more color, more yellow, more blue here. It's called cutter eye. There's also motoglins. And then the last place, the last cyclic we'll see is Thrifty's aureus. Again, you know their aureum because of the blue stripe. Very, very colorful cichlid. We call this the gold arias. They're just spectacular. And they look like this year round. Except when they spawn, they kind of lose the color and they get the barring. One of our trips to Mexico, there were 17 of us, I think, uh, Pam Chin, I know I was talking, she was there. And uh, there were 17 of us, and we rented a room to house the fish. This is Dan Woodland. We had fish on the beds, fish on the dressers with the lamps taken off, fish in the drawers, any place you could set a bag, that's where they were. Ross's job was to tie the bags, and he wasn't keeping up, so he put them between his toes and, and his hands. And I end my programs with this message from Big Joe Middleton. He's, he's a guy who lives in the Northwest in Oregon. Very, very odd guy, but about a month after his first collecting trip, he sends me this thank you notes, and he says he's getting used to the diarrhea. So with that, and I thank Chelsea Smith for helping me with the PowerPoint years back, and thanks for my sponsor, Zoom and Cobot. Thank you for listening. I'll be here for questions, so thank you very much.